All right. Hello and welcome to episode 114 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. Today, we have someone who is no stranger to the show. Um, You're most likely already listening to his podcast. If you're listening to this one, we have the one, the only, Brody Sharp, back for a third appearance to drop some knowledge like he always does. Thanks for agreeing to come on the show again, Brody. Thanks. I feel like a, a boxer with that intro. I feel like we should have some music being played as I step onto the stage. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Um, yeah, today, guys, we are going to be talking about the topic of kind of guidelines on when to run or not to run if you suffer from an injury. So really, honestly, Brody, you don't need to give a full detailed bio um, for our listeners. Um, They can definitely check out some of your background story in some of the previous episodes that we've done or click one of the links in the show notes to get all your goodies. But can you tell our listeners why you would be someone who is qualified to speak on this topic of kind of guidelines on whether or not we should run when we're injured? Yeah. So um, by ways of qualification, I am a physiotherapist, um, been a physiotherapist for 10 years and have niched down in my career and started working with only runners. And I have been doing that for several years now. And I'm on a mission just to try and educate runners as best they can. I dive into the current literature as best as I can. I interview as many um, health professionals as I can on the podcast and over the course of the years, I've just managed to build up kind of a bank of knowledge around running wisdom, how to train sensibly, how to overcome your current running injuries. And, you know, when it comes to injury prevention or running performance, um, I try and dive into all of that and disseminating a lot of that information to try and make it applicable and easy to understand to runners. And so that's the mission I'm on. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about this particular topic today. Oh, and I'm excited to have you on. And yeah, guys, if you haven't heard, you've been like hiding under a rock of some sort and you haven't checked out Brody's uh, Run Smarter podcast, you definitely need to. Uh, He shares like amazing content um, out there and like I can't even keep up with it. Like, I don't know how he does it. This guy's like a machine. (laughs) Um, He puts out a lot of content. Uh, So he's got some great stuff. He's going to bring the fire today. Um, You're definitely going to, you know, walk away or run away. Uh, with some pearls that you're going to be able to take with you if you're not injured right now, hopefully you're not, right? That you can, you know, use in your kind of toolbox in decision-making process. Um, And if you are injured right now, um, this is going to be extremely helpful for you. Um, So in this episode, we're really going to be chatting about like some of the most common questions that Brody and I get on a daily basis. Um, When runners reach out to us, you know, we're going to be answering questions like what causes running related injuries, what happens to like an injured area when you have pain? Is it okay to run with this type of pain? And then really, how do you accurately like interpret pain signals? You know, what do you do if you can't run? Um, Why is rehab important even if you can still run? Um, And then really what running variables influence your recovery from your injury. Um, And if you want to check out the previous episodes that Brody's been on the show before, those would be episode 63 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where Brody dropped knowledge on best running form. And then also episode 17, um, where we did a deep dive on shin splints um, and really how to get back to running um, if you have shin splints or you've had shin splints. So check those previous episodes out if you like anything that Brody has to say uh, during today's talk. So I think uh, we're ready to get rolling here. I'm just going to give a little shout out to our, our people that are hopping on here live and Facebook here. Um, Coach Katz here, Sue's here. Bob, how you doing? He says, my favorite two podcast hosts. Yes. <laughs> yes. There we go, Bob. Go, Bob. <laughs> uh, Amanda's here on the live. Amy's here. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, Amy says, hey, Brody. Um, so yeah, we're pumped to have you here. Um, in our healthy runner uh, community, as always. So let's kind of get into this topic of first, really, you know, what causes running related injuries, Brody? Great to start with, because I think we need to say this at the start of most of these topics, because then it'll lead into uh, more complexities as we as we go on with the interview. But for the most part, um, we're looking at a load versus capacity kind of model. 
essentially most running related injuries, they're not traumatic. So they're not like sometimes we roll an ankle, but when it comes to sporting injuries, some of those might be contact sports. They might get tackled or a fall, but for most running related injuries, it's mainly due to overuse. You're just, you know, you're not falling, you're not rolling anything, you're not twisting anything. It is just you doing the same thing, the same action over and over and over again. And if you train well, if you have a well-structured training plan, you mainly train within your, what we call your adaptation zone, this adaptation sweet spot that actually gets you stronger. But a lot of runners are either impatient or just aren't aware of certain training errors that might be present and they overload themselves. They do too much too soon. Their training might be too abrupt, whether it's preparing for a marathon or doing like a high mileage week that's way too much for their capacity, uh, doing something running too fast if they're not prepared for it, changing their shoes that's too abrupt if they're not used to going from supportive shoes to something quite minimalist, that transition needs to be quite gradual. If they're used to running on level ground and then all of a sudden they're doing hills and that change has been too abrupt for the body, it's essentially having the body withhold a certain capacity, it can withhold a certain amount of mileage. And if you train beyond that, that's too abrupt without the capacity to adapt and get stronger because we need time, we need patience to do that. If it is too abrupt, then it would increase your likelihood of sustaining an injury, getting to um, tissue fatigue, getting some micro tears, getting macro tears, and then ultimately like tissue failure, which starts producing symptoms causing an injury that's for the most part from the external load side of things. But we also know that there's the internal capacity side of things that ca- there's certain lifestyle influences and there's certain training influences that uh, change our ability to tolerate that load. So theoretically you could keep your training load exactly the same, but there's something within your lifestyle that makes you less likely to tolerate the loads you once could tolerate So that being sleep, nutrition, stress, like um, the emotional state side of things, all these things influence your ability to tolerate those training loads. And so coming down to a simple formula, it is essentially trying to work out your current training loads, your current capacity, and making sure that your training loads don't exceed the capacity that your body withholds because any abrupt change or any too much load too soon will start to result in that sort of injury process. Wow. That was well said, (laughs) well said. And just to kind of recap it really, that was, you know, so well done. I don't really think I need to, but it's, it's a matter of just doing too much than what the body can handle. Right. And that's what we talk a lot about on this podcast. You talk a lot about in yours is, you know, what are the ways that we can number one, train smarter, right? That's a name of your podcast is, you know, run smarter and, um, you know, do it the right way and then build up our bodies to help, you know, withstand those loads. And then, you know, from a trading side of things, make sure we train correctly, right? And have that proper progression. And uh, Katya, who is here on the live says, Brody, that she really appreciates your research um, and your newsletters, like the one today about transition to minimal shoes. So she's reading your newsletters. Uh-huh. She's, thanks, she's opening those emails. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for reading. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Stephanie, for jumping on here um, as well. So what happens when we do, unfortunately, like we all know the stats and, you know, most likely, um, you know, when we sent out our survey last year, um, we've had, we had 400 responses, um, that we were able to use in our, in our study. Um, you know, we, we reached 80% of the runners probably listening to this podcast, and I'm sure I listen to your show have had an injury at some point, right? So most of us are going to suffer an injury at some point. Um, so really what happens like to the injured area when we do have, let's say pain? I guess every injury will depend and every injury severity will depend. But for the most part, if you overload a tissue, if you overload a certain ligament or muscle or bone, um, they will get to a point where it either feels tight, stiff, sore, um, painful, doesn't necessarily need to be painful in the moment, but over time it just becomes um, a bit more irritated. The, the structures of that injured area and also 
potentially the surrounding areas, just become very sensitive, become very sensitive to load. So what you could once apply to that particular area, it can now not really tolerate while it's in this sore, painful, sensitive state. Um, so we do need to be very careful because not only is every injury severity different, but we also have different uh, ways of communicating. Like the body itself will tell you that it's sore in different ways based on the injury that you have. And say, for example, like if you have a tendon injury, uh, it might be a little bit sore in the morning, might be a little bit sore for your first movements of the day. Uh, but then when you start warming up, it can totally dissipate and people very much experience this with say plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendinopathy, um, any other sort of tendon injuries that the first few minutes of their running might be a little bit irritated, might be a little bit annoying, but as they warm up, the symptoms significantly decrease, sometimes gets to the point where it's absolutely pain-free and they kind of give that themselves a green light to continue on. Uh, but it comes back with a vengeance later. Like once you've cooled down, or especially the next morning, it can come back the same, if not worse than what it once was. And that cycle can repeat itself. And so every symptom, every injury presents itself in a different way. And depending on its current severity, um, those symptoms will change. But that's essentially what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the sensitivity to load. It can no longer uh, tolerate what was once applied and successful, successfully applied to the body. And yeah, it's, it's our job to try and mitigate or try and find your new adaptation zone, what you can currently tolerate. Right. And yeah, like you said that it is going to be kind of different sensations of pain, right? Like whether we have a nerve related injury, that's like burning sharp stabbing pain versus, um, something like the Achilles you mentioned, you know, feels more like the stiff, kind of uh, stiffness pain that someone feels at the beginning of a run and our bodies interpret, you know, those different pain signals differently. And everyone has these like different thresholds of pain. So it is always tricky when you talk to your running friends and you're like, well, I think this is what's going on, you know, and you're like, didn't you have that? And then they tell you, you know, their experience and it could be like completely different from what you're experiencing um, because every brain is different and every brain interprets pain differently and, um, you know, pain from an injury. So I think you explained that very well. And I guess, you know, the big question we always want to know as runners, and I know, you know, you, you have a similar mindset to, you know, some of my belief systems, but, you know, any runner really wants to know, like, can I run? Right. <laughs> you know, I got this injury here. Um, what's the moral of the story? Can I run through this thing or am I going to like wind up, you know, blowing my knee apart or, you know, is this something that I can continue training through? Um, so how do we like make that decision and how do we know, or how do you guide someone, you know, when you're working with them on, you know, whether or not they can continue running or whether they actually do have to stop running? It is something that does take a little bit of trial and error and interpreting the symptoms based on that trial. And if you're a runner that's really trying this and not getting anywhere, then it's best that you seek a professional for guidance on exactly what to do. Um, because runners, most runners take one of two directions when they get injured. They're either the stubborn, persistent runner that just will discontinue running anyway. And they'll run because symptoms are quite mild They'll run because, uh, you know, it's, it's what they love. It's what they do. It's what they have to do. And so they'll get out there and they'll, they'll continue to run through an injury. And it's not until the injury is so bad, it's so severe that they can't run is when they eventually seek treatment. And usually by that stage, there's a lot of damage. It's very hard to work your way back to pain-free running. So that's the first approach is like that stubborn kind of persistent run that just needs to do and keeps continue pushes through. But then there's the other runner that might have been injured in the past, maybe really sensitive to injuries or really cautious and does the opposite and says, okay, as soon as there's a bit of pain, as soon as there's an injury, okay, I'm injured. Let me stop running. Let me stop running for a couple of days or a couple of weeks and reassess, get back into running once there is, um, once I'm symptom free. And there's obviously 
everyone on a, on a particular spectrum. Some people go from one side to the other, like it's, it's a, a big fluctuation, but the most productive, most proactive approach is somewhere in the middle. Uh, for most injuries, there are exceptions to the rule. Usually stress fractures are that exception. Like if there is a stress fracture, we totally rest. We need to take weight off and we need to allow the body time to heal for that. But for most other running related injuries, you can mainly get away with some form of loading. And if you don't try to apply with some form of loading, then you enter what I call the pain, rest, weakness, downward spiral. And it's something that I talk about often on my podcast. And it is essentially what we were talking about before when a particular injured site is uh, painful, it's sensitive, it can no longer tolerate the loads that it once could. So if you treat that with complete rest, what you're doing is you're subjecting that injured structure to further weakening. You're fostering further weakening because you're not applying any load. You're just taking, you're totally avoiding your running, you're deloading it and that contributes weakness. And so when you go back to running or strength training or cross training and it exceeds that capacity again, increases pain, you say it hasn't healed yet. Let me take some more time off. You pull back off. And so you rest it and you continue your trajectory down this pain, rest, weakness, downward spiral until you eventually get to a health professional and say, I can no longer tolerate, you know, 10 minutes of running, like walking barefoot hurts, these sort of exercises, these cross training, everything hurts um, just because they're so deconditioned and that area is so sensitive uh, to any load because you've been subjecting to that downward spiral. And so the answer and why I start with this kind of trial and error is when you're in, when you first experience symptoms and you say, okay, I've overdone it. I, my mileage increased. Yes, I know I shouldn't have done that session. Now I'm dealing with these current symptoms. It's your job or the job of a health professional to establish where your current adaptation zone is because you still have an adaptation zone, but in this sensitive state, it might just be slightly lower or weaker than uh, when it's not in this irritated state. So that could still be running. It could still be strength training. It could still be cross training. Any form of that particular activity that doesn't exacerbate symptoms, um, but still like it still might produce some mild symptoms, but doesn't exacerbate beyond your baseline uh, during that particular activity and settles relatively quickly. So as general guidelines, I'm going to talk very general because every injury is different, but generally for most running related injuries, uh, particularly tendons, we sort of have these pain rules that say, okay, anything, any pain level below a four out of 10. So your zeros, your ones, your twos, your threes during the exercise is what we label acceptable provided that there is no exacerbation of symptoms afterwards including later on in the day and especially the next day. So there's no carryover. Uh, if you wake up the next morning and your symptoms are elevated beyond your normal baseline symptoms, that means you've done too much, but they're the, they're the sort of pain rules um, as well as your symptoms need to be improving week by week. So pain levels during exercise, less than a four out of 10 returns to baseline within 24 hours and you see an improvement in your general symptoms week by week, then you know that your current load has been okay. Your injury is handling the current load that you're subjecting it to. And of course, like depending on the injury, we can manipulate certain things within your running. We can manipulate certain strength and rehab exercises to make sure that process is a lot quicker and a lot more effective, a lot more efficient. But generally speaking, those, they're the guidelines that we're following. Oh. Yeah. Wouldn't you say, honestly, that is probably the most common scenario that you come in contact with? Because I know I do. And, you know, I'm working with a client and I had a bunch this past week. And if you guys are listening to this, you know who you are, um, <laughs> who, you know, reached out and was like, hey, you know, they were really kind of questioning, um, you know, whether or not they should be running at all. And I, I said to them exactly what you just did. Um, and it is, it is tough, right? If you have been a runner that you've gone to, you know, a traditional medical provider, no matter who it is, whether it was a PCP, an ortho, a physio, a chiro, um, no matter who the professional was, um, but 
you know, the mindset was, hey, you know, I need you to shut down running right now. Let's get you pain free. Um, and then you can go back to running. And like, I understand, like, I'm a little older, if you could tell by the gray hairs than Brody is, right? When I started practicing, I told my patients the same thing. Like, I remember that day, like, I remember those days. And that's how when I went to PT school, that's where we were taught. It was like, get a patient out of pain. And then when they're out of pain, then you can return to sport. It was always return to sport, return to run. Um, so I understand that. But really, you know, practicing the way I practiced the last, you know, decade to 15 years, really, and allowing patients to actually continue running like you're talking about, Brody, like not only, you know, mentally, right, because we all need our, that mental clarity and release that we get from running, but physically, too, like you actually do recover better, right, and quicker and you stay, you know, injury free longer, right? For your future. Cause you're building up that capacity that you were talking about before and just kind of that adaptation zone versus the old, you know, stop it. And, you know, you get on this constant cycle, this constant injury cycle. So, um, guys, what Brody is sharing here is like gold. And this is really the, the essential part of getting healthy from any running related injury right? The injury that might've, you know, crept up, um, when you were running and it's hard, it's hard for me to even call them running related injuries. Right. Because then again, it, it almost gives it the stigma of like, I wouldn't have had this injury if I wasn't running. So maybe I shouldn't run to get better from the injury. Right. I, I feel like that's the, the belief system that when we say running related injuries, but yeah, but if you weren't running, then you wouldn't have got like the mental health benefits, the other physical benefits that you get from running. Um, and like you would have had 15 other diseases or, you know, things going wrong with you um, that, you know, having a stiff Achilles at the beginning of a run that if you get the right strategies you can take care of um, is a lot better than having, you know, cardiac disease or, you know, some other type of disease process and risk factors for, um, so many other things. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Is that like, it must be right. Like the most common story, like I hear all the time from clients they work with. Yeah. And I guess it depends, you know, the general philosophy of the health professional they're going to usually the ones that will say, stop running, wait till symptom free, then continue run. Usually they're not really a runner or they haven't really worked for runners that much. Um, usually if you seek a health professional that is a runner, they'll try and keep you running at whatever capacity you can. Um, and then as a last resort, we'll say, okay, you can't do some running just yet. Let's do some other alternatives to stay active, maintain your fitness and then keep going because that's the beauty of continuing to run, finding your new adaptation zone, interpreting your symptoms and continuing to be active is like you said, you're maintaining the the strength, like the, the physical side of things, you're maintaining capacity, not only for that injured site, but for the rest of the body, you're maintaining your mental well-being because you're the type of runner that's just loves running, loves getting out of running, loves getting out on a day, on a nice day and getting those endorphin releases to that exercise. So you need to really consider the mental impact and the, the well-being impact if you were to tell someone not to run um, because that has true con consequences. And people are scared when they have to stop running. And usually it's one of the main reasons why when someone is injured, they just run through the injury is because they're scared of losing fitness. They've spent so much time training for a marathon and building up their capacity, building up their long run, their weekly mileage, and then to be derailed by an injury and having to you know, sacrifice all this gain that they've made and they're like in denial. They're like, no, I've spent so much time. I don't want to lose fitness. Let's, let's like continue running through it. That's usually the mindset that, that someone places themselves in. But in reality, if you were to catch this symptom early and be really proactive early, you might need to only make the most minimal change. Sometimes if I uh, am 
seeing a runner for physio and you can tell that they're really strong. You can tell that their symptoms are only really minor. You only need to make the slightest adjustment. It might just be give them a rehab exercise. It might be turning down their intensity by 10% or turning down their weekly mileage by 15% and then dialing it back up again over the course of two or three weeks. And they definitely haven't lost fitness uh, and their symptoms are like subsided and that's all that needs to be changed. But if you're stubborn and sort of run through a particular injury and get it really severe, then maybe those um, adjustments won't suffice. Maybe the, it, we do need to correct course or make a bit more of an abrupt shift to find your new adaptation zone. Cause by that stage, your adaptation zone is probably a lot lower. And so those drastic changes need to be made. Yeah, indeed. Um, absolutely. And we do have a question here um, on the live here, Amy. Thank you very much. Um, so Amy is wondering um, what your views are in keeping healthy loads um, just through running. So such as, you know, are you able to keep healthy loads by doing hills or different speed terrain um, consistently? She's wondering. Like, is that enough to kind of maintain those healthy loads? I believe is the question. I think, I, I think there's enough there for me to answer it. I, thanks for your question, Amy. Uh, I do think there are a lot of variety that you could put in your running to make you more resilient. Uh, usually what we want to do as a runner is we want to keep the body guessing and adapt to several different components, several different varieties uh, so that you are a bit more robust and you can handle the endurance, the strength, the speed, plyometrics, power, everything. If you can maintain and build all that and you have a high capacity for all those things, then you are a, a resilient runner. Um, whether you can only, whether you can only do that as a runner, I guess it's like, yes, you can change your speeds. Yes, you can change your terrain. You can do hill repeats. You can do strides. You can do intervals training. You can train it a whole bunch of different levels and adapt to all those things from a, um, from a physiological side of things or like a body adaptation thing, you're not offering your body a certain type of stimulus, which is the slow, heavy stuff, the strength training, which I think might've been a part of Amy's question or the reason, like, can we get away just with running and not having to do strength training or cross training, um, those sort of things. And the answer is you can, uh, there are certain risks associated with it because everyone has different running goals. If your goal is to run a marathon and you're already building up high mileage without breaking down, then maybe you can get away with it. But like we said at the start, these are overuse injuries. These are doing the same things over and over impacting the body in the same way over and over. And, if you were to change up your variety and do hills and do strides and do your, your slow, easy runs and keep that variety going, yes, you're changing the demands of your body, but you're still running. It's still very similar in terms of the, the demands that you place on your body. So the likelihood of getting an overuse injury is still quite high compared to if you were to take one of those training sessions away and replace it with strength training where you're doing this slow, heavy stuff you can't get that slow, heavy stimulus within your running training. Um, and you're also reaping the rewards and the carryover of performance because we do know there's a ton of evidence that heavy strength training increases your running performance, either with, with endurance stuff, with like marathon stuff, anywhere from 5K, 10K to marathon. You will increase your, your running ability. Um, and you're just not placing that same repetitive strain every single time you run um, because you're taking some of that strain away and doing something different. And I was having a conversation with one of my clients yesterday about this. And there's a study around tendon synthesis and it's essentially the tendon getting stronger and stiffer and what slow, heavy stuff does for it. And if you were to do, um, if you were to load the tendon in the gym, 70% of your one RM and you were to do um, 10 sets of 10 reps. If you were to do that, the tendon will get synthesized. It will sort of rebound. It will adapt, get stronger, stiffer. For you to try and do that and equate the same amount of adaptation, you need to run 36 kilometers to get the same amount of repetition and stimulus to have that same adaptation. So 
in that like little loose um, analogy, would you rather run an extra 36 kilometers and risk a running related injury? Or would you rather do 10 sets of 10 at 70% one RM and get the same amount of benefit for the tendons? Um, that's a, that's something, the risk and reward that you need to weigh up. So yes, variety is very important for reducing overloaded injuries. Um, I do think there is a place for strength training, but um, it's up to the individual goals and the, I guess the enjoyment factor as well. There's a few things that we have to consider when, you know, advising these upon runners. Well said, Brody. Well said. I couldn't agree anymore. Um, and I would just double down on, you know, if you've listened to any other episodes here, you know how much, you know, I am a proponent of strength training for multiple benefits, um, not only for kind of building capacity, um, but performance, as Brody mentioned, injury prevention, um, and yeah, adding that variety into your training. Uh, so that will help, uh, you know, bulletproof your body, so to speak. So even with a lot of the clients I work with Brody is, you know, if it's a time factor, then yeah, we're going to have to shave off, you know, either some miles on one day, or we're going to have to take a run out one day, but you got to give me at least a minimum 30 minute session of, uh, you know, strength training. Um, that's at minimum, you know, ideal scenario would be two 30 minute sessions, but for some individuals, depending upon their level of fitness, you know, they should be doing, and again, depending upon their training cycle throughout the calendar year two, um, and if they're in their kind of off season of racing, then even three, um, you know, sessions per week of just building up that capacity that you mentioned. Um, so, so important. And Amy says, thank you. Um, she appreciates you answering her question, Brody. Great welcome, question, Amy. Amy. Great question. Um, so now Brody, let's take the example of, let's say maybe if you can give some, you mentioned, um, stress fractures before, but any other conditions that really like jump out at you of when you're definitely like, Hey, you should definitely not be running on this. And then, um, if that is the case and a runner can't run, you know, what do you recommend for those runners that you do wind up giving the recommendation of, you know what, this injury is just not one, unfortunately that we can run on. Definitely shin splints and stress fractures. Usually with shin splints, I would say the running rules for myself change a little bit. I think the people tend to thrive and su succeed with their rehab if the pain levels are a little bit less. So instead of less than four out of 10 during exercise, usually I play around with less than three. So your zeros, ones, and twos, they tend to, to fare with kind of fresher legs. Um, walk run intervals are definitely a key component of that. Um, so shin splints, I change those rules around a little bit. Stress fractures, yep, time off. Uh, you just have to, it's it's such a serious condition that we need to treat it quite seriously. Uh, there are different areas of shin splints that are high risk and low risk. If they are low risk and it's a very mild form of shin splints, it might only be a couple of weeks off. But if it's a high risk area and it's quite severe, then you're looking at, you know, six to eight weeks off that, um, like non-weight bearing on that particular area. But like I say, Shin splints, uh, stress fractures, I should say, depends on the location, depends on the severity of that pathology, depends on, you know, what we do um, prescribe. But when you're able to start loading a little bit again, swimming is good for stress fractures early on because it's non-weight bearing. Uh, but then you can start doing a little bit more weight bearing. So like jogging in the pool or doing something that's less impactful impact on the body. So eventually you might get to cycling, um, which just doesn't have that ground reaction force that running does or the elliptical. So transitioning from the, the bike to the cross trainer, elliptical trainer where you're standing, but you're just not generating that same ground reaction force. And then we can just get into jumping on the spot, then, you know, jogging on the spot and then just slowly applying those loads. That would be some, some options for people like that. Um, other running related injuries, aside from shin splints that I would change the management, I think most of them, like say muscle strains, tendinopathies, um, ITB syndrome, um, I think they are like quite common plantar fasciitis, like all of these sorts of things are 
ones where I'd still apply those same pain loads and those same pain rules that I have um, I described before. And in particular with their rehab as well, if they are prescribed strength exercises or they're still, they're already doing gym exercises, those pain rules still apply. It's while you do your squats, your deadlifts, your lunges, um, any plyo activities, as long as the symptoms of that injury are below a four out of 10 during, as long as it returns to baseline within 24 hours, and as long as it gets better week by week, then those training loads in the gym are still acceptable as well. Absolutely. Great point. And notice how, you know, Brody honestly pretty much said that you can actually continue running, um, you know, unless it really is going to be a stress fracture. Um, you know, the other, other one though, it's so rare, Brody is, you know, some, you know, type of really, you know, bad nerve injury, right. And like a really hot, you know, radiculopathy, uh, that someone's having down their leg, you know, I wouldn't have someone run through that, but it is rare that we see, you know, runners with that, or, you know, they usually don't get it from running anyway. Right. They get it from, doing something else. Um, but they may be a runner, um, who's looking to get back into running, but you know, guys, those are, are, you know, most of our injuries, there's a way to actually utilize the guidelines that Brody talks about to actually continue running while you get better. And so with that being said, Brody, if we can still run, like, do I even need to go to rehab? Like is rehab important? Like, why do I need to go to rehab? Yeah, good question. Uh, it, I guess it'll depend on the type of injury and how much knowledge and how much, um, how proactive you are being because some people might overcome an injury and say, yep, all I need to do is just change this and I was fine. But then that injury comes back, comes back like several weeks, several months later. And then you're dealing with like the same boom bust of that same injury time and time again, you're probably missing something. It's whether it's your running, whether it's your strength training, whether it's your training philosophy, intensity distribution, there's something within there that's causing that injury to come back. If it's come back two or three times and you haven't uh, seeked medical attention, definitely get it checked out because you, you can say, look, I overcome this injury quite easily, but it just keeps coming back. Maybe there's something that's going wrong. Can we, you know, start going through the checklist to make sure I'm doing everything correctly. That would be a good source of, um, or appropriate, uh, scenario to actually seek help. Other scenarios that are a little bit more on the severe side of things, people kind of have an injury that's mild, doesn't get worse week by week, but just doesn't get better. And they've just been dealing with a niggle of a one or a two out of 10 pain that just hovers in the background. It just hasn't gone away for four, five, six plus weeks. That would definitely be something that you need to get checked out because like I say, there can be mild levels of symptoms during the exercise. It can still return to baseline within 24 hours. And people can check those two boxes and say, I don't need to get it assessed because I'm within this acceptable pain boundary but then you just see it just stick with them. They have a couple of good weeks, they have a couple of bad weeks, they have a couple of weeks where, you know, just still hovers around that one or two. They might even have a pain free week, but then it just comes back the week after. And then you look at yourself like two or three months down the track and it's still there. Um, that's a very, very common scenario that I see where I would say definitely get it checked out. You definitely need to be more proactive with getting on top of this. It might be, um, potentially some rehab exercises, some strength training exercises, some cross training, something that we need to do. Because if I see a runner with that particular presentation, I see how they've behaved over the last two months. And then if I try and forecast myself of where they will be two months in the future, they're probably going to be in the exact same scenario because they haven't done anything different. They haven't changed anything about their management. They're just learning to live with this particular condition. Um, and then it's just like, any sort of scenario, any sort of injury that just sort of persists. Um, if you if you do get an injury, you're not too sure what it is um, and it's still hanging around for a couple of weeks, definitely get it assessed because you'll need to know, um, not necessarily the diagnosis, but you'll need to know what to do for that particular condition. So if you are not familiar and you have had this unfamiliar pain and it hasn't settled um, and by seven days, it's still there, that's when I'd get checked out also because there might be something that's just not going to get better on its own if, you, if you're doing what you're currently doing. 
Oh, this is this is amazing, Brody. For those that are not watching the video version of this and you're listening on the podcast right now, Brody just like answers the question. I sit here, I drink my tea out of my Lion King, <laughs> um, you know, mug here, my nice yogi calming tea that I have that I will read you guys the nice little motivational quote, uh, which is smiling is the most basic kind of peace work. Right. Aren't these yogi teas great? Yeah, really inspirational. Nice. Gives you some good stuff. But I love it, Brody. You come on the show and I just like kick back, relax, drink my tea. Like, and that's <laughs> it. Like, I just say, hey, I would completely agree. <laughs> Nothing to add here. Um, so that's great. And what do you um what are your thoughts about, you know, are there any specific like running variables that we can change as runners that may influence our ability to actually recover from a particular injury? Tons, uh, depending on the type of injury, if we can just go down the list, um, we can start with patellofemoral pain, the most common injury out there for runners. Um, cadence, changing your cadence can be very important. We know that increasing your cadence, which is the amount of steps that you take per minute, um, if you increase that by 10%, you reduce your knee loads by 15%. And so that can be very, very um, important. And that's a particular variable that you might want to pay attention to. Hills will also um, change the variable of your the knees. Um, so running uphill, just because you run with a little bit more knee bend will generate higher kneecap patellofemoral loads. And so we do want to be careful with that. So if someone does have patellofemoral pain, they say, I got it um, because I've just moved house and I'm in a very hilly terrain. Um, and you also have a look at their running and they have a low cadence. That's There's some variables that we can change and be like, all right, let's increase your cadence by 10%. Let's stick to the flats as much as possible. Maybe try and find um, a street that's quite flat and do some loops around that and maybe start to slowly incorporate hills here and there as symptoms allow. Um, that would be a good one for, for knees. Uh, if we're talking about ligament injuries, so high hamstring, um, calf, Achilles complex, plantar fascia, usually speed will be a major influence. So people might be able to tolerate high running volumes just at slow speeds. Um, if you, they catch it early enough and they all, all they need to do is manipulate that particular intensity, that particular variable, and things all of a sudden settle down. And then that reintroduction for speed work is just a little bit more gradual. That can be an influence. And I guess with hills as well, um, running uphill, the amount of propulsion that is required is quite high, especially with the calf complex. So your calf and Achilles tendon. Um, so maybe it's just as simple as walk up the hills. If you do have to do hills, just walk. When you get to the top of the hill, then you can start your running again. Um, so terrain, speed, the frequency that you run, um, that can actually be very helpful for uh, if someone is running high volumes, but they're only doing two to three times a week. So if they're running, you know, seven miles twice a week and they've got this injury, how about we reduce it to about three to four miles and do it three or four times a week? So you're increasing the frequency, you're doing the same running volume just spreading it over more days and that can give your, your body an ability to handle it a bit more. Um, really interesting study with um, J.F. Escoulier who did a study on patellofemoral pain. They got um, 69 people with patellofemoral pain and sorted them out into different groups. And one of the groups got them to just continue running as they were, um, no change. Um, no, sorry, all the three groups, they had them increase their frequency. So they were told, okay, all you need to do is run at the same mileage, but just run over more days. The other one was to do that same thing, but to add strength training. The other one was to do that same thing, but add in um, stretching. And so they found out that after that, that period of time, all the runners got better at this exact same rate. Um, and goes to show how much influence it has on load management and is spreading things out over a longer period of time because all of those 69 patellofemoral pain patients, they had pain for more than two months. So they weren't just going to spontaneously get better 
over that period of time. Um, so they were getting quite persistent. All they did was change those things, change a few things with their load management, and they were quite successful. Um, they also were told those same pain rules as well. You're allowed to run at this same volume. Pain levels need to be below four. Everything needs to return to baseline for that dosage to be successful. Um, and yeah, they just got better on their own. So those particular variables can be quite useful. Yeah. And I would, I would totally agree about the frequency aspect of things. A lot of times, you know, many of the runners that I work with, you know, they'll tell me either they do, you know, maybe five miles, you know, three times a week, or they do 10 K three times a week, right? It's like, they do the same distance three times a week, or they do eight miles three times a week. Like this is what I do. And you know, when we're actually starting to work together and I say to them, well, I'm going to build out your plan. We're going to start with a four day run plan. They're like, wait, like I have this, you know, pain or niggle that I'm having. And, you know, there's no way I could run four days. Like my body can't handle that. It can't handle four days. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, trust me, believe me. Like the more frequently we actually allow our bodies to adapt to the demands of running throughout the week, um, you're going to actually be able to run with less pain versus running less frequently. Um, and it's, yeah, it happens so many times and it's like mind boggling to them, but it's not like they're going to run that eight miles. Right. So we're keeping, like you said, you know, that weekly volume around the same of what they were doing, but now we're spreading it out a little bit more and we're allowing for an easier, lower mileage day, um, throughout their plan and throughout their weekly runs. So, yeah, no, great, mm -hmm. great points about, you know, definitely the Hills for those Achilles folk. And, you know, I had some mild Achilles symptoms and that was the thing that would, cause around me, like there's a lot of Hills in this area. Um, and it would be, you know, when it was a little bit higher pain levels for a couple of days, I had to walk the Hills, um, because it was, I knew like it was definitely stressing and that was irritating. Um, so yeah, all great points, like so many variables that we can change. And again, this is where, you know, everything I've already said, it's going to be hard for you guys to take all of that and kind of synthesize it all right and apply it. Um, so that's where working with someone, you know, like Brody um, or a physio who specializes in working with runners is so important because this is what you're going to get versus a physio or physical therapist that doesn't work with a lot of runners. They'll help you from the like the injury side of things and they'll give you, you know, whatever heel raises or heel drops, um, you know, that they've implemented before, but they're not going to be able to change those running variables that Brody just talked about and, and really take that running injury that you have running related injury, <laughs> open air quotes for those on the podcast <laughs> um, and apply it to your training. So you can stay running. Right. And so we are kind of offloading certain areas of the body um, and allow you to actually stay running, doing what you love um, and all the other <laughs> benefits that we talked about before. So, yeah, such great stuff, such great stuff. Um, I definitely want to be respectful of your time. Um, as always, I always appreciate um, you coming on, Brody. So let me just do a, a quick little recap for those that hopped on here late or just as Brody shared so much knowledge tonight, guys, didn't he? He like he shared so much. So I, I really want you guys to think about like the things Brody talked about today is really like the main causes of running related injuries. And he really talked about the training errors, right? And, and overloading the body and those tissues. He talked about like what happens to the injured area when we do have pain, right? And how does the body signal that? And, you know, is it more of an inflammatory response? He talked about pain levels, kind of gave us some guidelines on, can we actually stay running or do we have to shut it down? We talked about the rare cases that we have to shut it down with stress fractures. He gave us some great, um, you know, alternatives to be able to stay healthy and stay fit while we are allowing that stress fracture to heal with some of the pool, you know, the swimming and the water jogging and then progressing to the bike, the elliptical, right? Um, but he really talked about those most common injuries that, again, if you're listening to this, you most likely have, right? The IT band, plantar fasciitis, the runner's knee, um, shin splints, um, Achilles pain. So, 
you know, there are ways that you can continue to run. We can change those variables that he talked about. Um, so this was great, Brody. I'm sure there are going to be many runners um, who aren't already following your show um, who are like, wow, like I need to start, you know, checking this guy out here. So where is the best place for runners to kind of connect with you? Definitely the first place is to check out the podcast. And I would always recommend runners go back to the first 10 episodes, which covers the 10 universal principles to reduce your risk of injury or overcome your current injury. So most people would listen to those first 10 before moving on and just scrolling through the feed to find things that they find particularly interesting um, because 220 episodes on, there's a lot to get through and there's injury specific stuff. So if you are managing an injury, then it will have dedicated episodes to shin splints, ITB, any sort of tendinopathies, um, patellofemoral pain, all those um, injury related stuff. But there's also a lot of performance related stuff. I interview a lot of researchers, interview people like yourself, like top class health professionals. And yeah, the whole goal is just to educate the runner to survive and thrive to, you know, overcome your injuries and, increase build upon your running IQ. So if that interests you, then you can just check out the podcast. And then most people, people just naturally kind of extend from there if they like what I teach and they sort of start following on Instagram. So at run smarter series is my handle, or they join the, the Facebook group or um, they sign up for a free um, 20 minute injury chat that I have available. And yeah, then just naturally just flows from there, but I always encourage people to start with the podcast, invest in your own knowledge first and take it from there. Awesome. Hey, Brody, it's always a blast catching up um, from the other side of the globe. In case you guys, we didn't talk about it, but in case you can't tell from his accent, Brody's coming to us from Australia, um, from down under. And uh, it's always a blast catching up. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, Thanks again for coming on the show and hopefully we'll be able to, I actually look back. It was actually 2020 the first time you were on and it was 2021 and now it's 2022. So I'm there sure we'll go. have you on in 2023. We got to yeah. keep the streak alive, <laughs> but thanks for, More than thanks happy for coming to. on. <laughs> Any opportunity I get to talk about running, I absolutely uh, will take that invite. So I had a blast coming on and yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. And thank you listeners for tuning in. And remember every week we go live recording these podcast episodes right within our Healthy Runner Facebook group. So thank you for watching the replay either within our group or our Spark Your Training YouTube channel um, or your favorite podcast platform during your run. I appreciate you guys. So thanks again. And remember, let's stay active, let's stay healthy, and let's just keep on running until next time.